Guys, to be honest, I was debating whether I should show you this or not. Because sometimes you find something so amazing that you kind of just want to keep it to yourself. So I was like, should I share this? Should I not? No, I'm lying. You know I share everything with you guys. And today, this something is not a something, it's a someone. And it is Edward Rooster. Here he is right here. And today we're going to jump into his stock twits room, The Big Stack. And I'll link to all his stuff so you can check him out. But let me tell you a little bit about Edward. This guy is on a different level. So he's a trader too, just like us. He focuses on trend trading. We've known him for a long time through macro ops, but he's also really, really good at tech. And let me just show you what he does at the big stack. Just scroll through his uh, room. Basically any important article that has to do with tech that comes out, he is breaking it down for you. He reads, I, I can't even imagine how much he reads, honestly. And then he digests it all and he makes these amazing connections and he's just like really knows so much and is posting constantly, just sharing everything. It's amazing, it's so valuable. And I was talking to Edward on the phone yesterday and I was like this is insane like the depth of his knowledge and the ability to connect all these different things like I wanted to pause our conversation real time and just kind of take notes or just build a matrix about how he was connecting all these different things I needed it to slow down really it's kind of like when you're talking to him you start to think that maybe he has that neural link already that Elon Musk thing that connects you to a computer because you get into his stuff like he has another room just like this sub stack for trend trading and the amount he consumes and produces and breaks down and connects it almost doesn't make sense but anyway i'm gonna have the honor of working with edward through some macro ops projects that we're about to do i'm really excited for that but i wanted you guys to check out his stuff first this guy is next level so in his room he just posts like awesome stuff and i love it because it's like a curated feed just for me i'm a big tech guy and i like combining it with markets which is exactly what he does so for example he'll post some things like this just interesting here's how old these unicorn companies are turning in 2019 spacex is 17 years old it feels like just just a few years ago that they were finally getting up into space, right? But nope, they've been doing it for a long time and Edward even posts about how the Dragon, their latest launch, their main launch, it just docked with the space station. And you can see the difference between what the Dragon looks like now versus what they had before when a group of astronauts were going up there. I mean, really, it's night and day. And as Edward says, you know, we kind of get a bit jaded about SpaceX. It seems all run of the mill now, but we're about to witness the first manned SpaceX mission to the space station. This is all private space flight. This is Elon Musk doing this. This was unthinkable a few years ago. The stuff they're doing is amazing. Let's see what else he has here. Oh, finally, Amazon is going to stop selling these stupid dash buttons. Have you guys seen these before? So what Amazon wanted you to do was put a physical piece of uh, equipment, plastic, all around your house. So if you run out of paper towel, you'll have a little bounty button right there. So you get to press this little plastic thing and then you get an automatic order through Amazon. You get a little cotton nail button. So when you're sitting on the toilet and run out of toilet paper, you could press that button real quick and hopefully you have drawn delivery so that toilet paper can just come through your bathroom window in 20 minutes and i assume with the placement of a cottonelle button it would be a little more brown than blue huh Ugh. Oh, essential, a mac and cheese button, because we're all eating that much mac and cheese every day. And of course, you have your Gillette button. When you press it, it tells you that you're not a real man and to do better. Thanks, Gillette. Tide button they actually got rid of a while ago because kids kept confusing them for Tide Pods and eating them. But I always wondered, what was the reasoning for these stupid Dash buttons? So Daniel Rausch, an Amazon vice president who helped grow the Dash program from its start, said that back in early 2015, when the Dash button first came out, there were far fewer options for connected home gadgets. Amazon workers were trying to figure out a way to make shopping disappear. For grocery list items like paper towels and printer ink and whatever else is pretty not fun to go out and buy. Okay, yeah, no one wants to go grocery shopping. So they were trying to automate a way that you could get all this stuff directly to your house with no hassle. Over the past four years, Amazon has created dozens of dash buttons for items including Soylent meal replacement drinks, Slim Jims, and joint supplements. Oh my God, where would you keep all these buttons? The company shipped millions of these tiny buttons. So Edward says, think of this this is the end of one button keyboards and the rise of connected automated home services and of voice. So yeah, now that we have Alexa, you know, you don't need these freaking buttons. You can technically place that order through Alexa, which when I look at the data, people haven't been doing. That's not how they use Alexa. So we'll see if this voice change actually happens. So people are using voice a lot more than they did, but it's for like Alexa, start a podcast. Alexa, play Despacito. It's stuff like that. It's not like Alexa, buy me toilet paper real quick. They haven't seen the sales come 
come through yet. Maybe it's still early though, because it is really early for voice. Like Gary V, he's all over voice. He thinks that's the next huge thing. So I bet eventually they'll figure out a way to monetize it directly through their retail business. But until then, at least they're in everyone's home just listening to everything they're doing. So they get that head start. Here's a graphic that Edward shared showing how insane the growth is in esports. So the light blue or teal or whatever this color is, that's the total revenues with media rights, advertising, sponsorships, merchandise and tickets and game publisher fees. And then this other color of blue, I don't know, why would they pick such similar colors for this graphic? But that's purely brand investment revenue. So media rights, advertising and sponsorship. So look at this thing growing from 2016 to 2017, 33% year over year, 2018, 38.2%. And then from 2018 to 2021, it's gonna go from 906 million to 1.65 billion. The growth is insane and a lot of the smartest guys, the early guys are really capitalizing on it. These classical or uh, traditional team owners are all jumping in on the game. And I don't know where this article is, I don't have it, but the way these guys are training, these uh, athletes, right, the esports athletes, they got facilities like workout gyms and all this stuff just as nice as the regular pro athletes. So this is a serious space that a lot of people, older people, aren't paying attention to as much as they should. Fortnite itself is becoming like a virtual avatar type thing where people are going to marshmallow concerts on that platform. It's getting weird. It's getting beyond gaming. I know Edward has been tracking all of this. We need to get him to write a long form on it. That'd be fun. Here's another uh, piece that Edward shared about the innovation cycle. And this is actually something I talked about when I was talking about 3D printers, which I published that what, months ago, last year. So he says a long upswing in a cycle starts when a new set of technologies begins to emerge. So like the steam, rail and steel, electricity, chemicals, internal combustion engine, all in the mid 19th century. The upsurge in innovation stimulates investment and invigorates the economy. As successful participants enjoy the fat profits, they set the standards and they kill off the weaker rivals and establish themselves as the dominant suppliers. When that happens, the boom peters out. That's when the technologies mature and returns to investors slide. And then after a period of slower growth comes the inevitable decline. But then what follows that is a fresh wave of innovation which destroys the old way of doing things and creates the conditions for a fresh upswing. That's where that famous term of creative destruction comes from. So waves of new innovations now seem to be rolling in every 10 to 15 years. And here's where you can see where different technologies are on that innovation curve. So you got the innovation trigger, the peak of inflated expectations, the trial of disillusionment, the slope of enlightenment, plateau of productivity. Now, actually, I can't figure out when this thing is from, but I'm not seeing a blockchain on here. But think about how blockchain worked, right? And Bitcoin and all of this. You had that innovation trigger, it became a buzzword, and this peak of inflated expectations, that's the Bitcoin bubble we saw in 2017. This is when everyone was like, oh my God, Bitcoin is going to change everything. And you could just put a company out and say, oh, it's blockchain. And then you'd get a bunch of funding. Well, we saw what happened to that bubble, right? It popped. And now we're kind of in this trough of disillusionment. And I know, I, I know it's not trough. It's trough, isn't it? God, you know, I, I just want to pronounce words the way I want. A trough, a trough. Doesn't a horse eat out of both of them? Anyway, blockchain is definitely around in this area because the hype is gone. But the smart companies are continuing to plug away. The smart ones that didn't need the hype to raise all the money and the yada, yada, yada. And pretty soon in the next five to 10 years, we'll hit that slope of enlightenment where the technologies will start becoming popular again and that's kind of where you will find companies actually you'll find them even now but not so much public companies that's where you'll get to invest in public blockchain companies that are small that could turn into like the next amazon or something crazy all right one more let's do one more i told you this stuff is great like be careful when you go to this room you might get lost just keep scrolling and scrolling it's like a one-man show of just great content it's like a better twitter feed perfectly curated so it looks like in Instagram is struggling with IGTV, which makes me happy to hear because I did not want to do that platform, which is why I haven't done it. I want to stay on YouTube. And I know everybody made such a big deal about it when it came out, like it was the next big thing. And there were so many articles that said, this is the death of YouTube. This is going to take over everything. It's the new Netflix. But I don't know why I'm getting annoyed. I mean, it's just clickbait. I should have made those same clickbait videos. The death of YouTube. But anyway, unlike the wildly popular Insta stories, the social media juggernaut's new extended video service has struggled to capture the culture. Digital talent does not talk about it at all. So one of the reasons why creators aren't talking about it is because it wasn't set up right. It didn't have monetization. Instagram said, here, here's IGTV. You start creating content for us and eventually maybe we'll pay you something. Who wants to do that? And there's not even a good way to monetize. Like in YouTube, you could put links everywhere. You could set up subscriptions. It's a lot more built out for creators to monetize beyond just ads 
ad revenue. And on YouTube, at least you get a cut of that ad revenue, which is very little now. But on IGTV, you didn't even get that. So what's the incentive, really? And that's exactly what I thought when it came out. But still, all the articles were like, this is the next big thing. Glad it isn't. But if Instagram wants IGTV to catch on with its 1 billion users, it needs the buy-in of creators. The promise that they can make real money on IGTV, likely through a YouTube-style split on revenue that Instagram makes via advertisements. Like I said, they're not even sharing the revenue on that. So I mean, IGTV happened because Instagram saw such growth with their short form video with the stories. And I mean, it's not just stories, just video on the platform in general. So June 2013 is when that 15 second video launched and you can see the growth projection from there. And as they expanded it, people actually watched more. So it worked. It wasn't just a short form clip that was important. It was, you could do longer too. Stories finally launched in 2016 and look, it's just exponential growth. And then here finally, June 2018 is where IGTV launched. So will long form have the same impact? Not yet. We'll see. I'm pro YouTube. All right. If you like this video, definitely go check out Edward's room. I'll put the uh, link in the description. And if you haven't already, make sure you sign up for my FOMO trading guide. There'll be a link in the description up above. Just go to the page, put in your email and I'll give you this guide for free. And of course, subscribe to this channel and hit that notification bell. So you get an email notification when our next videos are released. We publish every single day and we have some great stuff coming out with Edward too. So subscribe and I will see you in the next video. Stay foul out there. Bye.